The great philosopher Rick Ross once said, every day I'm hustling. That's the common thread among our list of 10 of the richest African Americans. We're diving into the lives of powerhouses who overcame poverty, discrimination, and death to become some of the richest people on earth. We are sure number one on our list you've never heard of. At number 10, Jordan Peele. You might know Jordan Peele from his hilarious hit sketch show, Key and Peele, but his bank account is no laughing matter. Born and raised in New York City, Jordan's first taste of putting on shows came from him majoring in, you guessed it, puppetry. Luckily for us, he dropped out to pursue comedy. His comedic chops landed him a spot on the late night comedy sketch comedy show, Mad TV in 2003. Here is where he met future co-star and friend, Keegan Michael Key. His run on Mad TV ended in 2007, around the same time. He was in the running to join the rival and more popular late night sketch show, Saturday Night Live. Unfortunately, his career was brought to a halt that same year when the Writers Guild of America went on strike. After floating around Hollywood picking up bit roles, he finally formed the dynamic duo that put him on the map. Key and Peele launched in 2012. The show was a hit, winning two Emmys and a Peabody Award. The show's YouTube channel to this day has over 5 million subscribers and brings in over $1 million a year. But he really started to make scary money with his next project. In 2017, Jordan shocked us with his original screenplay, Get Out. Made on a budget of $4.5 million, the movie grossed over $250 million. The movie received a 98% rating from Rotten Tomatoes and officially crowned him as the new king of horror films. He followed that up with the terrifying film Us, then made us scared of mirrors again, with a remake of the classic horror film Candyman. He then had us double check the clouds with his award-winning film Nope. Those films alone grossed over $760 million. The next person on our list has dreams the size of skyscrapers. At number 9, Don Peebles. Born in Washington, D.C., Don Peebles learned the value of hard work at a young age. Young Don frequently assisted his father, who was a mechanic, and in high school, he was an intern for two members of Congress. After graduating from Rutgers University, Don Peebles became a real estate agent and appraiser back in his hometown. By the early 90s, Don Peebles was already a force in real estate. He had successfully launched two real estate adjacent firms and hired by the mayor of D.C. to head one of the biggest real estate development projects in the city's history. But his next feat put him in the history books. In 1996, Don Peebles redeveloped the famous Royal Palm Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida. The original Royal Palm was gravely damaged by a hurricane in 1926. It was condemned and torn down in 1930. Some 60 years later, Hurricane Don came through and resurrected the Miami icon, and the Royal Palm Resort became the nation's first major hotel developed and owned by an African American. His next challenge would break the stratosphere. In 2022, Don Peebles spearheaded a group that proposed to build the most inclusive skyscraper in U.S. history, a 2 million square foot mixed-use building called Affirmation Tower. Don's ambitions will show the next generation the limit is beyond the sky. Number 8. Byron Allen Byron Allen started his career as a comedian at just 14 years old. By the age of 18, he had become the youngest comedian ever to perform on The Tonight Show by Johnny Carson. His appearance on the legendary late night show provided pivotal, as he became interested in not just performing, but how shows were made. Byron's appearance on The Tonight Show opened up new opportunities in television. He was first hired as a reporter, wrote, and starred in a TV show, then hosted his own late night talk show. The Byron Allen Show, which ran for three seasons. But Byron saw the real lucrative opportunities did not come from putting your face on the screen, but by owning the productions. In 1993, he launched CF Entertainment, a production company devoted to low-budget non-fiction programming, and its first program was a syndicated talk show hosted by Byron Allen. He tried his best to keep costs low with tactics such as using hotel rooms as studio space and bartering deals with networks at no upfront cost. But Byron still found himself in financial distress. His home was threatened several times with foreclosure, but he wasn't able to pay his phone bill, which led to him having to travel to the nearest payphone to conduct business. But like they say, the show must go on. Byron Allen was able to weather the storm. He renamed his production company to Entertainment Studios, and after gaining moderate success through original programming, began to acquire different media entities. In 2012, he made headlines when his company acquired The Weather Channel. Now, Entertainment Studios is worth almost $5 billion, and Byron no longer has to worry about his house troubles, as they went away too when he purchased a Malibu mansion in 2022 for a gut-busting $100 million. It's safe to say the phones work there just fine. The next man's bank account is just as great. Even though he was sleeping in his car not too long ago, 
At the number seven spot, we have Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry is known for his larger-than-life character, Medea, and his even larger-than-life studio in Atlanta. But what you might not know is how many obstacles he overcame to get his billionaire status. Tyler dropped out of high school before going back to earn his GED. Like a common high school dropout stereotype, Tyler had an epiphany while sitting on the couch watching TV. In an interview, Tyler said he was inspired to become a writer after watching an episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show, and when Oprah tells you to do something, you do it. So in 1990, Tyler packed up everything he owned and began his life-changing journey from New Orleans to Atlanta. He then took all of his lifetime savings of $12,000 and invested it into his first stage play. The play opened to luck laster fanfare and less than stellar reviews. It was a downright financial failure, and with him unable to recoup his initial investment, Tyler found himself homeless, living out of his car in the early 90s Geo Metro. Not to be deterred, Tyler kept writing and scrapped together enough money to put together another play, then another, then another. Six years after sleeping in his car, Tyler was able to take his stage shows from local community theaters to mid-sized theaters all throughout America. His shows began to see 35,000 people per week. At his peak, Tyler was releasing 300 stage plays per year, earning upwards of $150 million per year. His ambition spilled over from the stage to the big screen. Tyler's first movie, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, was an instant cash smash. The movie earned $50 million on only a $5 million budget. In that movie, the world was introduced to Tyler's biggest character, literally the 6'5 powerhouse Medea. The most prolific character throughout all of his productions was himself. Dressed as a woman who was inspired by his aunt and mother, alone, Medea-centered movies have grossed over $500 million. The man who was once sleeping in his car went on to build his own mega studio, a sprawling 330-acre lot that includes a replica of the White House. Tyler's hard work, determination, and unwavering commitment to his craft earned him billionaire status in 2022. We've already seen a billionaire rise against formidable odds. Now we can add America's first black billionaire to that list. At number six, Bob Johnson. Born in Hickory, Mississippi, Bob Johnson was the ninth out of 10th children born to a school teacher and a farmer. According to an interview, Bob said, we weren't poor, but I did have to push my way to the table. As a child, Bob's desire to work displayed early when he began his own paper route. That hunger and ambition led him to become the only child of the 10 children to go to college. After getting his bachelor's from the University of Illinois, then his master's from Princeton, Bob landed a job in Washington, D.C., AKA the Chocolate City. His jobs out of college showed him two things, the untapped potential of TV and the power of cable. After several years of working for others, in the spring of 1980, Bob Johnson took out a $15,000 loan to launch his own cable channel, Black Entertainment Television, better known as BET. BET was the first ever media company to cater specifically to black people. It quickly became a staple in the black community, reaching 62 million homes. With Bob at the helm, it became the first black-controlled company to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Bob Johnson's BET on himself paid off, when in 2001, the network he started was acquired by Viacom. The whopping $3 billion deal added $1 billion to Bob's bank account, making him the first ever American billionaire of African descent. Most people would sit back and relax after cashing a check that big, but not Bob Johnson. The very next year, he became the first black owner of an American sports team when he led a group that would purchase the NBA's new expansion team in Charlotte, North Carolina. The new team was called the Charlotte Bobcats. Who are we missing on our list? Comment down below. Now let's get back to the show. Sitting comfortably at number five, we have Jay-Z. Sean Carter, better known to the world as Jay-Z, is the first rapper to become a billionaire, but he wasn't always sipping Doucet out of Grammy. Born in Marcy Projects in Brooklyn, New York, Jay-Z showed genius at an early age. At just four years old, he taught himself how to ride a 10-speed bike. Sometime later, his mother bought him a boombox in an effort to keep him away from the street life. Her efforts took root, but it still couldn't keep him away from the alluring lights of the streets. Despite his close calls with rivals, police, and even death, Jay-Z went from the street corner to the corner office. His graduation from the School of Hard Knocks started to pay dividends by the time he released his first album, Reasonable Doubt, in 1996. Not only did he release a classic album, he did it by funding himself. Jay's music career crossed over to global status when he released his hit single, Hard Knock Life, which fueled his first number one album, Volume 2, Hard Knock Life. This became the first of his record-breaking 14 number one albums. Jay recognized the full power of his influence early on. His first business venture was his launch on Rockaware clothing. Less than a decade after launching the successful fashion brand, 
he sold it for $204 million. Jay-Z's thirst only grew once he was shunned by the champagne brand Cristal, which he helped make popular through his music. To quench his thirst, Jay bought the champagne brand Armand de Verignac, better known as Ace of Spades, and invested a large sum into the cognac brand Doucet. He was popping bottles a few years later when he sold shares in both spirits for a combined $1 billion. Jay-Z made millions of dollars off his music, including multiple six-figure touring deals and various partnerships, but his keen eye in business made him a billionaire. The next person is the first black woman to claim billionaire status. At number four, the illustrious Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey may be known to the world as the first black female billionaire, but she started off far from handing out free new cars to a studio audience. Born in rural Mississippi as a child, Oprah's family was so poor her grandmother would stitch up potato sacks to be used as dresses. That still didn't stop Oprah. After moving to Nashville, Tennessee to live with her father, she was voted most popular, joined her school speech team, and went on to win a Miss Black Teen Beauty pageant. Oprah's victory at the pageant caught the attention of a local radio station, who hired her while she was still in high school. Her impressive resume earned her a full scholarship to one of the nation's historically black colleges, Tennessee State University. However, by the time she earned her degree, she was already famous. Now you see, while Oprah was still in college, she became not only the first black female on screen news anchor in Tennessee, but also the youngest. So, when it was time for her to deliver her final assignment to graduate from college, she was so busy with work, she simply missed the deadline. She eventually graduated a decade later, but by then she had already had the number one TV show in the nation. In 1984, Oprah was hired as a replacement for one of the lowest rated TV shows in Chicago, a 30 minute show called AM Chicago. By the end of the year, the show was expanded to a full hour, rated the number one show, and renamed The Oprah Winfrey Show. The Oprah Winfrey Show would dominate daytime television for almost 30 years, and she was paid potato sack sizes of money for it, earning upwards to $300 million a year. She was declared a billionaire before her 50th birthday. Today, Oprah owns her own production company, her own cable channel, a book club, is an award-winning actress, co-authored several books, and opened her own school for girls in South Africa. She literally went from rags to riches. If you're enjoying this video, make sure you let us know by clicking that subscribe button. Now let's see how history was made by the next person on our list. At number three, the soaring, flying Michael Jordan. His royal heirness, Michael Jordan, was actually cut from his high school varsity basketball team. Just five years later, he made a deal with an unknown shoe brand that changed sports forever. Drafted number three in the 1984 NBA draft, Michael Jordan attracted the attention of all types of sponsors hoping to get the rookie at a bargain. During those days, most deals were standard and very few athletes had the cash to demand anything more. Good thing MJ didn't need cash because he had his mother. When MJ was being courted by sneaker companies, it was a foregone conclusion he was signing with German brand Adidas. The German brand even offered to buy him a car to sweeten the deal, but Dolores Jordan thought her son was worth more. So when she accompanied Michael on his pitch meeting with Nike, she offered them a deal. A five-year, $2.5 million deal was on the table, but Mrs. Jordan asked for something that had never been included in a shoe deal before, equity. On top of the $2.5 million, she requested a 5% royalty off of every shoe sold. Because of this, MJ became the first athlete to have ownership in a major sneaker company. The six-time NBA champion made $94 million, but from his Nike deal, he earns a tongue-wagging $250 million a year from the sales of Air Jordans alone. To date, he's earned $1 billion by retaining ownership global usage of his name and image. His mother really installed the concept of ownership into her son. Michael Jordan went on to become the first ever former player to be the majority owner in the NBA. Several years later, he took off from the free throw line again, straight to the bank, when he sold most of his majority ownership of the basketball team for a rim-breaking $3 billion. The next person on our list didn't make money from sports, but he's one of the biggest ballers in the world. At the entrepreneurial number two slot, David Stewart. Born in Chicago, David Stewart is one of the wealthiest men in the world, and a big reason was him learning the value of teamwork and sacrifice at an early age. When David was young, he watched his father sacrifice his career as a mechanic in order to provide instant stability for his ten children. That required David's father to take his family out of the city life of Chicago and embrace the farm life on the outskirts of Missouri. There, the Stewart family owned a few acres of land and some farm animals, combined with some odd jobs here and there. 
David's father was able to provide a better life for his family, and it showcased the power of entrepreneurialism to a young David. So in 1984, David Stewart, now married with two kids, started his own entrepreneurial journey. He founded his first company, Transportation Business Specialists, which audited and reviewed freight bill and overcharges for the railroad industry. After a few years, he was able to leverage the success and information gained for TBS, and he launched Worldwide Technology. Initially, WWT distributed IT hardware, software, and services, but David knew he had more than just products to provide. Back during his days of auditing railroad freights, he realized it wasn't simply the service he was providing, but the innovation and technology behind it. He carried that with him to WWT and became one of the leaders in the tech space, specializing in cloud capabilities, security, mobility, and networking technology solutions. With David at the helm, Worldwide Technologies is worth a staggering $9 billion and is one of the largest black-owned companies in the world. Number one on our wealthiest list may be a billionaire several times over, but his heart is just as big. With peak interest at number one, Robert F. Smith. Robert F. Smith was raised in a black middle-class neighborhood in East Denver. At six months old, his mother took him to one of the most pivotal moments of American history. In August of 1963, Robert was in attendance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech, and Dream Young Robert did. A fourth-generation college graduate, Robert earned his bachelor's from Cornell, then went on to earn his MBA from Columbia. After several years working between Goodyear Tires and Kraft Goods as a chemical engineer, he found new roots in the financial sector when he led the new technology-focused merger and acquisition wing of Goldman Sachs. There, Robert F. Smith advised on over $50 billion in merger and acquisition activities. This is where he saw the opportunities to really make a difference. So, in 2000, Smith set out on his own when he founded Vista Equity Partners, his very own venture capital and private equity firm. To date, Vista has over $100 billion in assets under management, with Smith at the helm as CEO and being named Dealmaker of the Year in 2019. But his most noteworthy achievement came in the spring of 2019, when Robert F. Smith pledged $34 million to pay off 400 graduating students of Morehouse College. Robert F. Smith's achievements are not bound by his bank account and should inspire others to not only earn more, but to give just as much.